let's begin. Um, I mentioned already, my name is uh, Yolana. Some of you have met me before um, throughout the year at King's events, or we've been emailing or calling. Um, and uh, I'll let our, our, the other two presenters uh, say hello as well, starting with Neil. Would you like to say hi, Neil? Sure, thanks. Uh, I'm uh, Neil Robertson. I'm the director of the Foundation Year Program. Uh, I actually was also a, uh, I'm a graduate of the Foundation Year Program. I took it a few years ago. Uh, and I'm also the coordinator of the fourth section, The Age of Reason, uh, and it's lovely to have a chance to talk with you now. Thanks, Neil. Hi, I'm David Swick. I am a professor in the journalism school. Um, like all the full-time uh, profs in King's Journalism, I worked as a journalist for a long time. Uh, we have some profs who are focused totally on television or totally on video, and my career was... Uh, a little bit of just about everything, newspapers, magazines, radio, TV, documentaries, a little bit of a lot of different things, nonfiction book. Um, but I'm uh, happy to be talking to you today. Uh, both of my sisters are lifelong school teachers and I always thought, why would anybody wanna do that? I didn't get into Kings till in my 40s and then realized, oh, journalism school, it's like being in newsrooms and magazines. It's so much fun, you're working, together editors and students or teachers and students and it's just so dynamic and so thrilling to try to make a change in this good way so i'm happy to be here talking with you about this today awesome this is a little agenda of what we're planning to cover in the next hour or so um, dr robertson will talk about the readings lectures tutorials and the essays and exams that uh, make up the foundation your program uh, as well as talking about the way that that program is going to look in the coming term um, as we, we teach it online. Uh, and then what we want to talk about is the stuff that happens beyond FIP. And for journalism students, that specifically refers to a class that you'll take in first year called Foundations of Journalism. And the other classes that you'll take uh, in second, third, fourth year beyond uh, in, in the journalism program and what that is like, what being a journalism student is like. And then we'll open it up to a Q&A and spend time together answering whatever questions you have. So that's our game plan for today. Uh, I'll turn it over to Dr. Robertson to get us started with the Foundation Year program. Ooh, I'm... Thank you so much, Yelena. Uh, I do that every single time. Um, so yes, uh, I wanna talk just a little bit about Foundation Year program, give you a sense of how the program is structured. And really at the core of all of this is how do we learn together? Uh, and there are really three ways that we engage in learning in the Foundation Year Program. And essentially, I'm just going to go through those three ways. Uh, and the beginning point uh, for all of that is reading. And we read these uh, wonderful texts you ha have on your screen, a kind of selection of, uh, of those texts. Uh, and uh, But not only are we reading important works uh, that are each and every one of them uh, worth spending time with and full of richness and depth that uh, is kind of inexhaustible, but we're reading them uh, chronologically. We're reading them from the ancient world, from uh, the Epic of Gilgamesh, which is a text from uh, the first known human city, uh, the city of Ur in uh, uh, in Mesopotamia, in Sumeria, <laughs> and uh, then we're going to be uh, going through a development uh, that takes us to the contemporary world, to our own time. In fact, uh, the last text we uh, are going to be reading uh, for the year coming up uh, is about another city, uh, about uh, New York City, written by Teju Cole. Um, so uh, this is an opportunity to uh, look at a whole series of uh, developments. You know, um, some people make a contrast between journalism, which seems to be about things happening right now, and the Foundation Year Program, which seems to be so historically oriented. But I don't know, this is one way of thinking about FIP, which is that it is the most in-depth journalism you could ever want to engage in. You're going to have a chance of looking at where our contemporary world, at least much of where our contemporary world come from, and where many of the problems and difficulties uh, that uh, belong to it. Uh, so sometimes I'll say that what we are trying to do is 
we're like fish swimming in water and we're trying to see the water we're swimming in. Uh, and so um, that's one of the ways of doing it. Um, and so we're going to be uh, going on this journey, on this odyssey, uh, which will take us from the ancients to the contemporary world. But in a way, the stepping stones of that journey are the books that we have before us. And uh, one of the lovely things about the Foundation Program is we're reading not about these moments in the past. We're not reading textbooks. We're reading from the perspective of individuals who lived at certain times and inhabiting those standpoints and then seeing how they evolve and change and interact with one another. Um, and we're reading books from a whole variety of different genres and disciplines and uh, different places as well. Uh, the main focus is going to be on the development that leads to modernity in the uh, 17th, 18th, and then into the contemporary world uh, through that kind of European development. But we're inherently doing it in conversation with things that are happening in the contacts and the interactions, often to terrible effect, that happen in that long development. So we're very much not simply kind of looking at a closed tradition or looking at it from the point of view of a kind of raw, raw, raw view of things, very much open to a critical and thoughtful reading of the deep issues, both the good and the evil that will arise as we think about uh, these developments. Um, and what you're seeing here on the screen is just a selection of those works. Um, uh, and they're coming from um, literature, from philosophy, from theater, from science, from history, from politics, art, and so on and so forth. And the help that FIP does is to give you a sense not only of these works in themselves, but in this overarching scheme. Uh, so you're going to be open to a variety of voices. Um, and uh, in doing so, I think that, you know, looking at it again from that journalism perspective, I think what that's letting you do is to see the deep sources of what is happening in our world today. So, you know, an image for me that has, that I was struck by in the news was seeing the president of the United States standing with a Bible, a book of thousands of years uh, in the making, uh, and um, of great antiquity in front of a, seeking to stand in front of a Greek revival church in Washington, D.C. And so much resonance is going on there. And then the next day, leaders from the African-American uh, spiritual communities wanting to reclaim that space, invoking often images that derive not only from their own experiences, but again from uh, identifications with the experience of the Jewish people in Egypt and so on. So that sense in which the things that are in front of us that news is going to be considering are not matters of a day, but they have this enormous depth in them. And uh, it seems to me that the foundation program is an opportunity for you to have that enriched sense of the depth of what is at work in the world we're encountering at every moment. Um, so uh, and let me just make one last point at the level of books. Uh, there's a kind of pedagogical principle that operates in the foundation program, which is that we're fundamentally equals here. None of us are, everybody is looking and reading and making arguments and understanding from the same evidence. We all have the same books in front of us. So you will come to an insight that I have never seen before. Each year is going to bring out new aspects of these works. And in doing so, will enrich things for everybody. So it's not a passive passing of knowledge from us to you. It's rather a participatory activity in which we are together trying to sort out this never-ending and rich uh, set of um, thoughts, works, texts, books that we're going to be looking at. Um, Yolanda, could we just move on to the next slide? So I mentioned that there were um, 
uh, three ways, I think, of uh, coming to learn in the foundation program. The first is the reading, so you, you do the readings, but then the next is the lectures. And uh, the lectures are an opportunity to hear somebody who has spent time, has an expertise in relationship to those texts that you've been reading. But the point of the lectures here is not to give you the final word on anything. It's rather really to give you a kind of first word, a way in, a kind of help in coming to understand these often challenging and difficult texts, which are coming often from very strange uh, contexts, that is things that we don't know. And, uh, and the, expert, uh, the expertise of the lecture can help us with that uh, in being able to better understand what's going on in these works. Um, and our lecturers, you know, one of the lo lovely things about the foundation program is that we can draw for our lecturers uh, from both the Kings and the Dalhousie and beyond faculty. So you're going to actually be exposed to far more lecturers uh, in the foundation program than you will encounter if you took uh, regular courses where you would probably only encounter, uh, you know, five or six or so uh, professors uh, over the course of your time. Um, so the lectures are really meant to be a kind of uh, development from your reading. Uh, and um, there's an opportunity every, we're hoping every Friday to set this up, uh, an opportunity we call general tutorial, where you can actually directly have a uh, conversation with the lecturers of the week, ask them questions and uh, pursue thoughts uh, together with them. Uh, so again, that very much that sense uh, that, um, that there's an opportunity to think together as we're going through things. Uh, should we just move on to the next slide, Yolanda? So this is really the heart of the program, the tutorials. Um, and uh, it, as you can see here, uh, it is a group of students uh, who are meeting together with a tutor and uh, uh, to talk about, to question, to um, interpret, and to debate the readings and the material that they have uh, that's been assigned along with uh, the lecture that you have had a chance to hear. Um, so this is really the moment where you are able to appropriate and uh, make your own that material. But the lovely thing in the tutorial is that you're doing it with others. Uh, so there's a chance here to not simply be thinking on your own, but have the advantage of the kind of larger mind that is at work when others are in conversation with you as you're trying to wrestle with and think through these thoughts. Um, so it's a place of free, uh, respectful discussion and questioning. And um, our tutors, I should mention, are not TAs. Uh, They're full-time faculty members uh, who are going to be very much involved in your education. Uh, and so the way we structure things, if you remember, there are six sections. So three of those sections interspersed throughout the year, you're going to have a main tutor who's there to guide you through the course of the year, uh, your tutorial. And your tutorial stays together throughout the year. So you get to know and work with one another, and you get to have that memory with one another about all the things that have been discussed. So you've got a main tutor who's going to be a kind of go-to person. Uh, in terms of your entire year. Uh, and then the other three sections is going to be different tutors. So you'll have an opportunity both for continuity, but also for uh, variety. Uh, and that's very much the way we try and make things um, function here. Um, and uh, the, um, you'll have opportunities to connect with your tutors, not only in your tutorials, but also in office hours. Uh, and so this is a sense in which the tutors will also be there for you on an individual basis to support you and, uh, and help you with your thinking process and really with your whole intellectual uh, work uh, in the foundation year program. Um, so uh, the, the tutor, the tutor student relationship, I think you're going to be, you're going to find to be an invaluable one. Uh, and, uh, 
uh, I can say from uh, experience that our tutors are much loved and much prized uh, by the, uh, the students. Um, so those are the main uh, kind of forms of our learning. Should we just look at the next slide? And essays and exams. That's more like the main forms of our assessment. But I don't think you should think about essays and exams as simply tools to assess your uh, performance because they are themselves also opportunities for you to learn more fully because you're gonna write uh, 12 essays in the foundation of your program uh, every two weeks. So it's a very scheduled and structured, which I think people find incredibly helpful and especially uh, in these challenging times, I think are especially helpful to have that kind of structure in place. Uh, <laughs> every two weeks, you'll be handing an essay in and in doing so, you will be developing. This is a kind of apprenticeship side of the program. You're going to learn over the course of the program how to write a very effective paper in which you make use of evidence and argument uh, and insight and interpretation to make your way uh, to develop your understanding of the text before you. So in fact, we, don't, we call them essay questions, but they're actually not questions at all. What you'll be given is a quotation uh, from, uh, or a series of quotations, you get to choose which one, but a quotation and then just the word discuss. Uh, so it's gonna be up to you to figure out what is important in that quotation and what kind of question do I develop from that and what kind of answer am I going to give in the course of my essay and then what evidence am I going to use from that text to support the argument that I'm trying to make. And you're, you're going to go on a development here, but I can assure you that by the end of the year, you will have developed a great capacity for doing this. And so our students in subsequent years and other, uh, as they go forward in their academic careers uh, and in their professional careers, uh, have all uh, acquired this uh, skill uh, and um, it marks them out uh, in relationship to other people in uh, in their, in their context. Let me also mention here, so there's that whole skill building side of uh, essay writing, uh, but there's also um, supports in doing that. We, uh, we ask a lot of you, uh, but we also do a lot to support you. Uh, and so not only are your tutors gonna help you with your essays, but we also have a writing coach, particularly to help you with those kind of writing fundamentals uh, that are, you know, again, crucial to get under your belt. Uh, to be successful in making an argument, which is something you're going to be doing as journalists uh, or in whatever other career you're uh, going to do. Almost all of us uh, are called upon to make a point and to make it effectively. Um, the other kinds of assessments that we have are the midterm, which you're largely familiar with, I think. Uh, it's the kind of um, uh, test uh, exam uh, where we're just looking for short answers, uh, and so you probably have some experience of that from your high school. And the goal here is to ensure, give you an opportunity to show the range of material that you have uh, a knowledge of, uh, the lectures and the texts. Uh, you know, so that's really what the midterms are about. The orals are um, interesting. They're a different uh, way of assessing, uh, but we found them to be a very effective way of assessing. Uh, they're an opportunity for a conversation. There's an oral exam at the end of each term. You'll meet with two faculty members and it's really just a chance for you to talk about um, your thoughts and understanding of the material that you're responsible for. Uh, and uh, uh, they don't last very long, they're just 15 minutes, but uh, they're a wonderful chance for you to display uh, the insights that you have gathered over the course of each term. Um, and uh, I just wanted to also mention that uh, the sense of student support is very much a part of um, what the foundation of your program is. So just a further aspect of that is we actually have an associate director of student support who will be also uh, there to support you in your work. But why don't we turn over this to the next uh, slide to talk about um, what is distinctive this year. Uh, as I am sure you all know, um, King's, like uh, most universities, 
is going to be going online in the fall. Uh, we're not totally clear about how things are going to go uh, in the second term, um, but uh, we are uh, definitely going online uh, in September. Uh, so we are making a few changes and uh, trying to do a few things to help ensure that that is both a successful and a rich uh, experience. Um, so, so what are we doing? Well, the the in relationship to the lectures, uh, what we're going to be doing there is pre-recording the lectures so that they'll be sent out to you on a scheduled scheduled basis uh, for you to be able to um, take in uh, in you know as is convenient in terms of your own schedule and uh, uh, your time zone and those sorts of challenges that we have. Um, so uh, the record, they will be uh, pre-recorded, but as I said, we will have an opportunity uh, to interact with the lectures themselves uh, once a week uh, at general tutorial. Um, the, so that's what people will call an asynchronous uh, approach in which you have a recorded thing and we're not doing everything at the same time. The tutorials are going to be synchronous, that is to say, they're going to be live and scheduled for a particular time. So one of the things that you need to do is sign up for a time slot uh, that's going to work for you uh, in the when you when you register uh, for the foundation program. And Yolanda, I think, is going to give you some uh, helpful thoughts around that uh, as we conclude things. Um, so the the um, the tutorials will be live. One of the adjustments we're making this year is. We normally, as you could have seen from that photograph, uh, uh, that slide earlier, um, have about 15 students in a tutorial. Uh, in uh, what we're planning on is to have about eight to 10 students in a tutorial uh, in the fall, just to help with uh, ensuring that this online format allows space for everybody to participate uh, and to feel connected uh, with one another. Um, and so. Uh, that uh, is a, a crucial adjustment that we're making that I think is going to really help with, because the tutorial is really going to be the moment where uh, at least, uh, you know, there will be other opportunities as well outside of the foundation program, but within FIP, the tutorial is really going to be the crucial place in which you're interacting with your fellow students and making connections with them. Uh, and uh, so we want to really make that work as well as we possibly can. Um, and uh, uh, the um, other point to make here is that whatever happens in terms of the conditions on the ground and whether we're able to do anything on a hybrid fashion with, uh, with people uh, in person, uh, the uh, online aspect, online lectures and online tutorials uh, are going to be available throughout the year. So you don't need to worry if you've got concerns about any of that in-person uh, aspect. So just to let you know that, have that confidence as we, uh, as we go forward. Um, and uh, I'm looking at my notes and I think that is everything I have to say at this point. So I'll hand things over to Yolanda and, uh, and David Swick to take it from here. Perfect, thank you so much, Neil. Um... I, I just, I'm just going to pop in just to introduce um, David, uh, who will be talking a little bit more about, um, about the journalism school um, and everything that happens kind of uh, during FIP for journalism students, but also uh, the kind of view from beyond FIP um, in the next years after. So I'll turn it over to you, David. Thank you so much. Thanks. And speaking of views, I love this photo of the King's Campus. I love that you can see the ocean in the background. The ocean's a 10 minute walk away. Actually, if you go down this way uh, to the right on your screen, the ocean is actually a two minute walk away. But the harbor there you can see in the background, Halifax Harbor, um, is so pretty. If you haven't been here, ask anybody you know. Halifax is a sweet uh, little town. And uh, the weather here is only really awful. We have this long beautiful uh fall which is terrific the weather's only really bad here rainy and cold in may and june and that's when you're not here so it's conveniently set up that way uh looking at this at uh, the king's campus here the building with the green roof on your left in the middle that's the library uh and i love libraries i spend a lot of holiday time in libraries in different 
cities and countries. And uh, a lot of libraries, it seems to me, the air isn't very good. And sometimes they're, um, they're not a place where you're going to hunker down and do work. And I love the King's Library. It's one of my favorite places in the city. Right, being a journalist, of course, I'll go off on these tangents. And there, that's my critique of this wonderful, wonderful photo. Um, so about uh, upcoming, um, you know, this weird time we're in right now with COVID, I don't think uh, going to online courses would, would be anybody's first choice, certainly not mine. I love working with students in the classroom. Uh, yesterday, though, I'll tell you, I had my first ever on-course class. Um, it's a master's class. Um, there are only seven students. Uh, but I was shocked um, how quickly, maybe 20 minutes, half an hour, that we had formed a sense of community. And it wasn't just because it was a handful of students. It was because the way that I've been trained in the last couple of months to address students online, um, I was thinking it was going to be clunky and feel a little fake. And, but within minutes, the students, we were all responding to things. And students started relaxing and posting little funny jokes when you know I mispronounced something wrong. And, it was just so, it, it worked out better than I thought. And that gave me great encouragement for the upcoming year. And I couldn't have said that just, uh, just 24 hours ago. I was a little trepidatious. And now I'm thinking, weird time. You know what Hunter S. Thompson said? Thompson said, when the going gets weird, the weird turn pro. So that's my motto for the next year. And you might join me in that. Um, so about King's journalism, we are adapting mightily to this new reality of going online. And all the profs are getting another three months of training in this to make sure that you have as uh, strong and um, productive and, ex and fun of an experience, um, the kind that you would hope from first year uh, university. And about that, you know, I should say I've always uh, been a year, of, uh, a fan of the gap year. I've recommended to various nieces and nephews uh, and children of friends of mine that yes, after high school, I oftentimes think it's a good choice. Um, this year, though, weirdly, I find myself thinking this isn't the right time, partly because and maybe this partly comes from being a journalist too. I love to travel. Journalists tend to love to see other cultures and everything. And um, this year with so much travel not available, I think if I was coming out of high school, I'd be thinking, well, you know, I can't go work on an organic farm in France and I can't, you know, go see Thailand and, you know, am I going to sit around the house? Like, so I'm kind of thinking that this year for my thinking is a good year to do first year university. And, it, and in um, journalism, partly because uh, first year journalism is not uh, an extremely hands on time. We don't hand you all the best cameras and all the best mic equipment and you don't sit down and interview the premier and the head of the nurses and all those people that doesn't happen in first year. First year King's journalism, it's, it's really important and you need it. You'll be a better journalist for it, but it's very much based in um, uh, what's called foundations of journalism is to give you a foundation. And of course, tying in with FIP, where I was surprised actually in the first slide, I was reading the list of books that Neil had selected to put up and I was surprised how many of those books that I had read as part of my journalism. Being a journalist from, for a journalist for a long time and turning to books to get a better understanding of different cultures or ways of thinking. And I'd read a number of those books and that kind of surprised me. So I, I do see where there's a tie in. If you want to move into journalism and end up interviewing the prime minister, you better know how the society works. And you get that partly out of the first year being FIP and journalism together. Um, so in uh, first year is the foundation year and second, third and fourth year of King's journalism. Then you move into a lot more of selecting various courses that you want. And if you want to go mostly into video or join me, I'm, I teach all writing courses, uh, um, come into writing magazine and opinion and, and features and other kinds of uh, writing pieces, then you would join me. If you want to go into TV, you do that. If you want to go into investigative, you can choose more of those. 
So in second, third, and fourth year, you get a lot more of those, those choices. Throughout the whole time in King's Journalism, though, uh, and especially in first year, what we are really doing is helping you come to an understanding of how journalists view the world. Do we get, you know, journalists get a bullshit detector that we can sniff out people like Donald Trump and, and others. And it teaches us courage to then stand up to these awful racist, misogynist, et cetera, people. You know, journalists fight for a better world and we help you get the skills to learn how to, how to do that. And part of what we're teaching all the way through and a lot in first year is clarity and precision. If you want to, you could have to be the hardest working journalist then in the country and working really hard to present good information. But if you don't know how to be clear and you don't know how to write your script for your video or your article or whatever it is, if you don't know how to write concisely and clearly, fewer people are going to be affected and that would be unfortunate. So we focus a lot on clarity and we focus on precision that you choose just the right word, that you get your facts just so. And like so many things in journalism, the skills that you learn in journalism school, they actually help you be a stronger human being and a better, more responsible citizen. Because then, you know, we have students who, you know, are fighting with a sleazy landlord and um, they take the skills that they've learned in journals in the school to know how to press the landlord to get the money that they're owed where they wouldn't know that, they wouldn't have the courage to do that. And we see this all the time with King's Journalism, how our students become more the people that they, that they want to be. So a big part of it in first year is clarity and precision. And you need clarity and precision in part to avoid mistakes like the one in this next photo. Okay, so this sign says that only the owner can park here but that parking is at the owner's risk. Using the word owner twice is hugely confusing because the first time it means the building owner, but the second time it means other people like you and me. So, but someone made the decision to put up this sign and paid for the materials and labor, but didn't choose the words to make their point clear. And you see signs like this everywhere. Judging by the three foot high gold letters, parking in front of this New York business has been a big problem. But what does the sign actually say? It says that no cars parking here will be towed away and the car owners will not be required to pay for towing. They're missing a period after no parking. And because it's missing a period, this sign says the opposite of what it means to say. And my strong hunch is that anybody arrested or getting a ticket for parking here could point to this sign and the judge would say, you're totally clean. The sign, the sign is totally unclear. So you come to King's Journalism and you will never paint this on your, the garage of your business. And it doesn't take a whole bunch of words to do this kind of stuff. One ill-chosen word all by itself can create confusion or concern. Okay, some Nova Scotian paid $121 plus another $34 every year for this vanity plate. If the main thing that you want to express to the world is that you have attitude, I guess that's okay. But when you're allowed only a maximum of seven letters choosing another correctly spelled word might have been advised. And sometimes letters aren't the problem, it's grammar. Graffiti, I have, a I have a very old soft spot for graffiti. When I see intelligent graffiti on walls in cities, I think that is really cool, especially when the writing is great. Here's a problem with graffiti though, you don't want people to dismiss your brilliant idea just because you don't know how to use our or is. 
this one should be where are the unicorns. But I love this idea. I think this is brilliant. But some people will dismiss it because it's not grammatically correct. And that's unfortunate and therefore worth learning that skill. Clear writing, on the other hand, gives a writer the power to surprise, the power to touch a reader's mind. This is a wonderful thing, and it can happen in the most unexpected ways. Story ideas are everywhere. And seeing this, I love fortune cookies. And um, at one point, I was a page two columnist for a long time in a newspaper. And uh, I thought, hey, who writes fortunes and fortune cookies? And uh, within five phone calls and maybe an hour, I had the man on the phone. He's in Montreal. He does all the fortune cookies for Eastern Canada. And a lovely guy. We had a really good chat. No one had ever interviewed him before. And the best part about was um, we were chatting about, he said every year he introduces 20 new ones and moves 20 out. And there are several hundred that he has in circulation, et cetera. And then I said, okay, the key thing though, when we get a fortune, are we supposed to believe it's absolutely true? And he laughed and he said, and I quote, it's bullshit. And on that tangent, I will bring it back to Yolanda. And I look forward to it in case you've got any questions on this phone call. All right. Well, that was a great segue because we're just about to launch into questions. So thank you very much, uh, both of you. Um, if you, I'm sure all of you have done a million of these Zoom webinars before, but if you haven't, for any reason, you're going to click on the button that says Q&A uh, to type in a question. And it's, uh, we've got at least 20 minutes. Um, so there's lots of time. Uh, I personally can stick around for really as long as you keep wanting to ask questions. Um, so, you know, feel free to fire away. Uh, and I also just want to say that if you, you know, I hope that you will type your question in um, to ask it so that we can answer it live. But of course, if you're feeling shy or if you'd like to formulate your question uh, later, you can always email me as well. Um, so there's, you know, multiple different ways to get in touch. So I'm just going to hang back for a minute just to see if any questions pop into the Q&A box. And, and if they don't, I'm just going to assume that we did an incredible job. Um, but I, right now, if you're thinking about something that you want to ask, I'm willing to bet that someone else who's listening is, is also wishing they could ask the same thing, because that's usually how it works. Okay, wonderful. So uh, Aiden wanted to know, since we will not have access to the King's Bookstore, how will we get our FIP texts? And additionally, when will our reading list be released? Um, so that's a great question. Neil, would you like to speak to that? Great. Yes, thank you so much. Um, so the uh, book list uh, is going to be released uh, very shortly, uh, and that will provide you with um, not only the names of the books that we're going to be using this year, uh, but also the particular edition uh, that you would need to look for. So uh, you can get that book uh, anywhere. Uh, and, um, uh, but I will uh, put a plug in here for our uh, own co-op bookstore. Uh, so this is a student-run, student-owned uh, uh, bookstore that you can become a member of. Uh, and all of the FIP books are available through it. And in fact, you can get them all as a, a bundle. Uh, and I um, believe that uh, they're available for less than you would be able to get them at um, a certain large corporation that sounds like a river in South America. Um, <laughs> and uh, so um, if, uh, yeah, so you can get your books anywhere. Uh, and if you want to, you could even get different translations or editions. I don't recommend that uh, because it makes life a little bit more difficult for you. Uh, if a lecturer is saying, you know, turn to page 57 uh, for this quotation, uh, then you won't be able necessarily to find that. Uh, but um, the, um, uh, the, the, yeah, so, so you'll be getting the booklet shortly and you can get the books anywhere, but uh, uh, the King's Bookstore is a good place to start and they will send the books uh, to you um, uh, expeditiously. Uh, and if you live in Halifax, I think Paul has even been known to bicycle to deliver them to your door. He did that for me recently. Yeah, 
Paul is a, a hero and a champion among independent bookstore owners. Uh, I mean, independent bookstore owners are already saints, but uh, Paul in particular is a very good one. So another question that we have here is from uh, Dylan, who wanted to know if, uh, David, if you have any specific recommendations or specifications that you would recommend um, for a student to get when they're thinking about what kind of laptop or computer they should use for the journalism program. Uh, do you have any advice about that? Oh, is this Dylan in Alberta? It is. Oh, I think great. I think so. Dylan, I believe this is Dylan in Alberta, who Neil and I met when we were on the lecture tour in November. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> um, you know, I'm sitting here looking at my almost brand new MacBook Air. I finally broke down and got a new one at Christmas time. So I'm looking at a 13 inch here. I'll, I'll tell you that the um, in uh, both journalism and book publishing in Canada and the States is almost exclusively Macs. Uh, and I'm walking through the different professors' offices here, looking at their stuff. Um, I think almost all of us have Macs. Maybe Tim is a PC guy. Um, you know, Dylan, it'd be best if you if you send that to Yolanda, and she could send it to uh, to Tim as a question to be sure. I'm giving you a generality that I know to be true, that publishing and journalism is hugely Mac in both Canada and the States. But um, if you are operating a PC, I've never actually owned a PC because I've always been in journalism. Um, but if you are operating a PC, don't rush out and get a Mac. Send the question to Yolanda and she can send it to the person who knows better than I do the right answer. My hunch would be that 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 could work as well, but you should you should find out for sure. Um, another great question that we have here is um, from Callie: uh, If the COVID situation begins to lighten up, uh, ease up, do you think there'll be a possibility that we could go back to campus early? Um, Neil, would you like to speak to this, or would you like me to address this? Uh, you can probably address it as well as me. Um... Yeah, why don't you say something and if I... Sure, so yeah. I, the statement that the university has made, uh, I will guarantee that for the fall term, we will be um, online. Uh, or I should say our teaching will be online. Um, and you should have gotten an email on Friday, which included a message from our Dean of Students, Katie Merwin. Uh, and in that message from the Dean, um, she pointed out that we are working on our plan to safely reopen our residences. So it may be the case that even though all of our students will be learning online in the fall, some of those students who are learning online might, might be living on campus, um, you know, while they are doing that. Um, in the winter term, if things really ease up, then our hope is that we'll be able to move into a kind of hybrid teaching model where there is some students engaged in in-person learning, but just like uh, as was said earlier in the presentation the online teaching option is going to be available for the entire year so um of course there are a lot of unknowns here a lot of things we don't know yet but i can guarantee one thing that i know for a fact will not happen so one thing that will not happen is you will not be in a situation on let's say january 8th at the start of winter term and the university will uh, suddenly send an announcement out that's like, hey, everyone needs to get here right away because it, online teaching is suspended and everyone has to be in person in the classroom. That is, a, I can guarantee you that that is not going to happen to you. Um, we have students from uh, all across Canada and all around the world, and we know that not everyone will necessarily be able to travel here. So, uh, so that's a long answer <laughs> to a question that, that still is... Um, kind of surrounded by several unknown factors and things that we can't quite predict. But the hope is that we'll be able to welcome um, as many students to campus as can possibly live here safely, uh, and that we'll be able to gradually move back towards in-person teaching. Uh, but the online option will be available for the whole year. I, I hope that that answered the question. Um, but if, if you wanna talk about this more too, I'm always available to uh, kind of address it. Mm. And then another question, uh, oh, this is actually going back to our campus bookstore. Is the bookstore available online? Um, how do we pay or make sure that we can get those books delivered to us? It is available online. The books will be delivered to you. It's just, it's like online shopping uh, through any other online retail, retail store. Paul will deliver them to you. He'll probably include like a sticker or a nice note or something like that. He's a good dude. Um, 
Another question here. Um, how do you recommend that students take notes during their FIP lectures? Which note taking method has been most effective among FIP and journalism students? That is such a good question. That is good. So, shall I start with that? Shall I start that, David, and then you can oh. mm -hmm. uh, pick up the pieces that I leave on the floor? Um, so I don't have any, you know, there's, there are um, actually different schools of note taking. Uh, I don't uh, know all the details of that. Um, to my mind, the crucial thing is to be active in your note taking, which is to say you're not just a machine recording it. In fact, this year that's already happened. And one of the great things, you know, one of the huge advantages of pre recorded lectures is that you can slow it down. You can go back and re listen to something that you didn't catch the first time. Uh, and um, so, you know, to my mind, and one of the things is you should be um, engaging in your note taking as a preparation for your tutorial, which means that if there are things you didn't follow or you couldn't make sense of or that you just thought were plain wrong, uh, you should put a question mark in your notes. And then when it comes to tutorial, you can recall that, you know, this is an issue that I had with what the lecturer had to say, or this was something that just didn't make sense to me. Uh, just as to my mind, you should be doing the same thing when you're reading. You should, I always read. What, you know, why I actually like having things on paper uh, is that I read with a pen in my hand so that I can mark the things that I think are important. That helps me analyze the text. And if I need to go back, am I writing an essay? I know where to find quotations. And it lets me say a oh, question mark. I don't know why that is happening here. Or this is really important and it's a linchpin. Uh, so really, to my mind, what you're doing when you're reading and when you're lecturing is always doing so analytically, looking for an argument and for the important points and for the most crucial pieces of evidence so that you can uh, construct in your mind what that text or what that lecturer is trying to say. Um, that's the best I can offer is trying to do it uh, so that you're engaged in the whole process and not just passively recording. <clears throat> In, in King's Journalism, um, we are, um, sorry, I thought of something else and now I've forgotten what's the question I'm supposed to be answering. Note-taking. Thank you. Yeah, it's about note-taking methods. And yeah. what, what in King's Journalism, um, it's up to the individual prof. Um, some classes, profs are happy to have the students on their laptops the whole time. Um, some classes, the profs request that uh, it doesn't happen. Um, uh, you might not think that a student uh, at this good school would ever be sitting in the back row gambling during class, but you might be wrong in my experience. Um, uh, and here's the other thing about journalism. In doing journalism, if you run down to the scene of a fire or we have you interviewing the mayor in your town um, or going to, you know, the scene of a, you know, protests of police action, et cetera. Um, there are a lot of times in journalism where you cannot uh, take out your phone and start tapping things out, or you're not going to be carrying a laptop. And where and a, a lot of people and, um, and powerful people of various kinds are not nearly as afraid of a pen and, and paper as they are of various forms of electronics. And for this reason, a lot of King's profs insist that you keep notes in their classes um, using a pen and uh, paper, uh, which I think is a, um, a good skill. Um, I've never taught in first year, although actually this upcoming year I'll be, I'll be part of the um, Tim Curry, the director, I thought I had a good idea. He said, you know, first year students really should meet and work with at least one of the full-time um, journalism profs. And so I'll be doing that in the, uh, uh, in the winter. And uh, so if I'm working with you, we can talk then more. Um, I like a lot of journalists. I never took official shorthand, but I've got, I don't know, probably a few hundred various things that I do it that are various kinds of shorthand that I came up with. And all journalists have these kinds of tricks to make sure that we can uh, talk to people and get 
an accurate portrayal of what they what they said, even when we don't have a laptop. Wonderful. Um, and one more question that we have here is, what benefits do King students get from the connection that King's has with Dalhousie? Um, and then there's a secondary question, which is, I heard there's a community, a community radio station where we can volunteer at and gain experience. Um, so this is a great question. We haven't mentioned Dal very much during this presentation, but in case it's not obvious, Dalhousie is an important part of uh, the King's experience. It's our partner institution. We could see a lot of it in that like nice aerial campus photo that we showed earlier. Um, would either of you like to talk about kind of what King's students, especially journalism students, get through through Dal? Uh, well, David could talk about the journal. I mean, in general, all King's students have a bunch of benefits from the relationship with Dalhousie. Uh, that is to say, we're right on the Dalhousie campus. You have access through King's to many of the services that Dalhousie has to offer, its libraries, uh, its um, um, gyms, and uh, uh, the one thing is you can't be on a Dalhousie uh, team, uh, but we have our own var varsity teams, uh, but essentially you function on the same basis as a Dalhousie uh, student you know, in terms of, uh, for instance, accommodations in the foundation your program. We do that through Dalhousie. If you need an accommodation in terms of uh, some uh, concern uh, to ensure that you're successful in the foundation program. Uh, health supports are all through uh, Dalhousie as well. So uh, there's a huge variety of ways in which you're getting the, the phrase we sometimes use is the best of both worlds here. Yeah, Dalhousie is the biggest university east of Montreal by large measure. It's about 20,000 students and King's is fewer than 1,000. Yeah, you know, we're nestled together like, you know, a, like a thumb and, and a hand. We are right, you know, most people driving by wouldn't even know it was two different schools. And at King's, I think it's just a wonderful thing about King's that you get to be part of this small, intimate community. The professors know your name. You talk to each other. Like Neil had said in tutorials, and the same thing happens in first through fourth year journalism. You're in these small groups where you're talking to each other a lot of the time. And, and the prof and the registrar and all these people get to know you. It's not like one of these universities that's massive and your first year psych course has 500 people, you know, that is not going to happen. And I think it's just wonderful. And another great feature too, is that you can look through the Dell calendar. And if there's a course that you really want, there's a special relationship between Dell and King students where Dell and King students can take a class at the other school, pay no extra fee, so it's like you're a little intimate king because you want to be partly in this feisty community, but where everybody knows each other and it's small enough to be human scaled. And you've got this calendar from one of the biggest schools in the country. What a wonderful feast. Um, that's all absolutely true. And I also just want to address because the question mentioned a community radio station. So I will say uh, the, the CKDU radio station at Dal uh, is a great place to, to volunteer, to have your own show as a journalism student if you're interested in broadcasting and radio. Um, we also have our own radio room in, uh, in our own study spaces at King's that our students use. But if that's the kind of thing you're into, lots of options there. Um, mm -hmm. There's another question here. And so a couple things I wanna clarify about this question. It says, is it true that the journalism FIP students have automatic acceptance into the law school at the University of Calgary? I heard that once, but I'm unsure how true it is. Great question. So uh, Neil, would you like to talk about the unique partnership that Foundation Year Program has with Calgary Law? Yeah, so the, uh, this is a true of any Foundation Year Program student, uh, including uh, the journalism students. If you've done the Foundation Year Program, then uh, you will be considered when you, you might say, made all the other uh, requirements for applying to the law school, uh, you will be considered to be academically accepted. Uh, there are other aspects to the acceptance that fall outside of this. So, so you're not atom, uh, automatically accepted per se, but you have been academic, at the academic level, uh, your qualifications are, are met. And uh, I'll just add to that by saying if you if the reason you ask this question is because you're someone who's just interested in the possibility that law school might be something you would want to do in your future. I, I want to be clear, the the excellent law school that happens to be located at UCalgary is not the only law school that King's graduates go to. In fact, they go 
Uh, many of them go on to do wonderful things, including law, really at any law school across the country. Uh, the president of the University of King's College, uh, Professor William Leahy, but we call him President Bill. Uh, Bill is a professor of law at Dalhousie's Law School. Um, and there are many, many people on campus that are passionate about law and justice. And so if you're interested in that whole subject area, there are lots of people at King's who want to help you explore it. And then once you get to the end of fourth year and you're looking into professional programs or graduate programs, if applying to the law school at UCAL is something you're interested in doing, uh, you are not automatically accepted, but just as Neil said, you, you do have a leg up because uh, you have some academic advantages that the, the faculty of law at UCalgary recognize. Um, and the reason they recognize that is because they know Foundation Year is a great program, uh, a great preparatory program. You know, an interesting thing about King's Journalism is 15, even 10 years ago, uh, all of us would design our, our uh, lectures and presentations to say, okay, so if the magazine editor tells you X, it means this. And it was all based in all journalism all the time. In the last 10 years, there's been this revolution. And I bet at least a third of the students who come to King's Journalism aren't really sure that they want to do journalism. A lot of them want to work for an NGO or work for a political party or various other ways to make a difference in society aren't sure about journalism, but they want the, the skills, the research skills and the presentation skills and all these other things that this school is famous for. And in the last five years, I bet I've written more reference letters to law schools. You know, every year it, it increases exponentially. I bet I could name at least 10 former King's journalism students are in law schools, one place or the other in this country. And that's a wonderful revolution that's, uh, that's been going on. Yeah, I mean, a law uh, journalism degree can really go anywhere. My dear friend Chelsea, who's a King's journalism grad, is a medical student now. Um, and so, that, you know, there's really no end to what you can do if you have good critical thinking skills, good writing skills, all of that clarity and precision that you were talking about, David, it, it really uh, translates over into different careers. There's one other question in the chat that I just want to make sure we, we answer, which is a question about uh, how do we go about selecting our courses for first year? Um, when, when does that happen? So I'll just move to the next slide to show you some of these uh, crucial next steps. So when you're a FIP journalism student, your, the, the schedule for you, the plan for you for first year is pretty much uh, predetermined. You'll be doing foundation year program, FIP, and you'll also be taking this class called Foundations of Journalism. But even though we know that those are the things you need to take, you still do need to actively register for them, sign up for them. Uh, and that happens on June 15th, is, or it doesn't have to happen all on June 15th, but that's when the opportunity to start doing that opens up. So you can register right away in the morning of June 15th, or you can do it on the 16th or the 17th, but you, you've got time. Um, so registration opens on June 15th. You should have already received um, communications from our academic advising team, Julia and Kirsten, giving you more information about how to register, uh, what steps you need to take, they will have sent you links to the YouTube video tutorials that we prepared that show you how the process works step by step. And if you want to talk to Julia or Kirsten or anyone else in our academic services team, I would definitely encourage you to do that. They're very, very helpful people. Um, and the email address where you can reach them is registrar at ukings.ca, which is right up there on the screen. The other thing that you can see on the screen is my email address, yolana.wasersug at ukings.ca. Please get in touch with me. If, if it's not a question that I can answer, I can direct it to the person who can. So uh, by all means, get in touch. And um, one last next step that I want to point out is um, just something really cool that I want to highlight. A group of future King students who are starting FIP in 2020 and who will be part of our graduating class of 2024 um, went ahead and started some social media groups so they could get to know each other. So if you are an incoming student and you'd like to get to know your classmates, you can find them all on Facebook by searching for their group, University of King's College 2024, or you can find them on Instagram, UKings2024. And uh, on their Instagram account, they're sharing photos and little bios and profiles about themselves and getting to know each other, uh, planning the occasional like Zoom hang, really, really fun stuff. So highly recommend. I don't know which students started these groups. And if that student who did it is listening to me right now, I just want to say kudos to you. Great initiative, love it. Um, 
I think that's we we were all there's no more questions coming in the chat box so I feel like we've we should probably wrap this up um, and say say farewell. Um, Neil, David, would you, do you have any last words you'd like to? No, add? just uh, have a great summer. If you do have any questions, uh, you can uh, contact Yolana or you can contact, for fifth questions, you can contact the Foundation Your Program Office. Uh, for people who need accommodations uh, um, due to uh, various uh, challenges, if you can please let us know as soon as possible and don't be shy about letting us know. Uh, we uh, love to be able to make sure that things are successful for you. Uh, so please reach out for that. Uh, but otherwise, um, uh, thank you so much for, for uh, being uh, participating in this and uh, uh, see you in September. I'll just say, uh, I too hope that you have a, a wonderful uh, summer. Life is still so excellent despite all the awful stuff going on uh, right now and we need to keep that in mind as well. Um, uh, and life is hard uh, and coming out of high school about to enter university, wonderful, fascinating, scary, excellent time. It will all work out. You will learn and grow and learning is you know half the fun of being alive so i hope that i get to uh, work with you at some point that uh, i love working with students so that would be fun thank you both so much for being my co-presenters today and, and making this happen and uh thanks all of you who are listening for tuning in stay in touch if you need anything and uh have a great evening